Hi, it's Benjamin Douglas Ray with another edition of Sustainable Cannabis TV, episode 71. I'm here with Dr. David. How are you today? I'm doing very well, Benjamin. Thanks for having me here today. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I really, really appreciate it. Now, you're Dr. David, so you said you've been calling yourself that uh, since 2006? Uh, yes, I actually have two doctorate degrees. I actually have one doctorate in physical therapy, and I have a second doctorate in healthcare management. And the irony is, is that many people butcher my last name. And so it was actually my very first publicist who said, people want to call you Dr. David from now on <laughs> because everyone butchers your last name and we can't have that. Dr. David was nice, simple, and easy. And it's, it's stuck since 2006. I love it. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, doctor's much easier anyway. So yeah, that, that that, that's true. great. Love it. Well, if you, uh, if you could tell viewers and listeners, where you are right now, uh, kind of where you're from, some of your background, your history, how you got into this business specifically. And then I got some questions for you after that, but welcome to the show. You know, and, and thanks again, Benjamin, for having me today. I really do appreciate it. So I've really been blessed over the years to really be a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I've been blessed to have started uh, 13 companies in the past 18 years. Um, knowing my family is an entrepreneur, knowing my family is a business owner, I'm the youngest of four kids, so call me the black sheep then, if you want. <laughs> uh, and really from there, uh, after having uh, some major reconstructive knee surgeries in high school, that's how I got into the physical therapy realm. Mm. I, I've had the pleasure and the honor to work for Olympic athletes, to work for Olympic physicians, to work uh, for professional sports teams in the NFL, Major League Soccer, the NHL. And from there, really start my own physical therapy clinics, personal training centers. And from there, I kind of got the entrepreneur bug. Mm. Uh, at one point, uh, my physical therapy clinics in North Jersey were rated uh, the number one physical therapy clinics for eight years in a row. Wow. Something we were really blessed about. And, and from there, just the entrepreneur bug kind of just caught, you know, caught wind. And, and people always ask, well, how, how'd you really start all that? And I was very blessed to have a really good business partner who was also a business mentor. Mm -hmm. He was about um, 13 years my senior. And when I needed to raise money for my very first business, he said, do you want to be an investor or do you want me to be a business partner? And I said, if I can get an investor and I can get to here, but with a business partner, I can get to here. Mm. And, and the rest is kind of history from there. And, and literally, um, I was blessing involved in the uh, medical cannabis space all the way back in 2009. Mm. Um, and we really uh, started fall, uh, actually producing articles on health and wellness for people and for their pets. So we are covering the benefits of cannabis uh, for, for humans. We're covering the benefits of CBD for dogs all the way back in 2009, 2010. As I joke around when it wasn't cool to be in cannabis mm. at all. Um, and, and from there, things is kind of really formulated. Uh, currently, I'm, I'm sitting in my, uh, my office in northern New Jersey. We also have locations in Portland, Maine. And we did have a place in Las Vegas, Nevada. But we just shut that down about mm, nine, ten months ago. Just because of COVID and everything going on, we haven't really need to do too much business in person out there. And, and plus, with technology today, you can really do a lot of business. Mm. Just like here we are now, streaming right. live. And, and, and talking. So it, from there, we really saw a need, not only in cannabis, but in general about investor relations advisors. Hmm. So me and my co-founder started UCS Advisors and Investor Relations uh, back in two, th actually about four years ago, this June. Hmm. And we started it because a lot of companies need help with creating their pitch deck, creating their executive summary, a lot of people need coaching on just how to talk to a potential investor, right? How to attract investors. I mean, we're we're live on, on LinkedIn, and and it's amazing. If you need less than one point five million dollars, if you position yourself correctly, you can do that through LinkedIn. Hmm. You no, know, it's it's not that tough. And and then on the flip side, twelve out of my thirteen companies, I've always had investors. So we've always had private investors, and when you make people money. They tend to follow you. Right. And so now currently we work with over 400 accredited investors uh, here in the United States. 
We work with about 175 or so over in Europe as well, too. Hmm. And on and then on from there, we help find them deal flow, which is usually 65, 70% cannabis related, but everything else is industry agnostic. Hmm. And the one thing, Benjamin, I think is really interesting is that so many people don't realize the overlapping of non-canvas businesses and cannabis. Hmm. Like you need lawyers, you need website designers, right, you need right. accountants. Um, if you're like a great example is a couple of years ago, we picked up a steel manufacturer. Oh. I don't know anything about steel nor anyone else on my team, but they wanted to build out a cannabis business vertical to have about 10 to 15 percent of their business be just for the cannabis industry. Huh. So we help navigate the industry for them and help them get involved in the sector. Hmm. And, uh, and that's kind of us in a nutshell overall. Oh, that's a great, it's a great history. It's a good path. But I'd, I'd love to know more about, you know, I think you'd said earlier, 13 companies, but you said something about, or at least when we were talking earlier, that you've started seven cannabis businesses in five different states. And I'd like to know kind of what that was like and, and just know more about that. Sure. Great question. So uh, started testing labs um, and we were so early to the game of testing labs where uh, I won't say which states, but we were in the process of opening a lab and the states were coming up with the rules and regulations still. So here we are twiddling our thumbs, waiting patiently for the state to come up with the rules and regs to actually make testing required. Hmm. From there, we actually worked with a, a vaporizer company. Um, then that led into working with a cannabis publication that which also then led to working with a cannabis extraction facility to then also working with a opening up a grow as well as a dispensary as well too. Wow. And even though we've always kept a corporate headquarters in New Jersey, people said, why New Jersey? And we say, whether you like it or not, New Jersey is very uniquely positioned where you have four major metropolises, literally in less than a four hour, uh, four hour time zone between Boston, New York City, Philadelphia. If you want to, we include Baltimore and also Washington, D.C. Hmm. And the the population of New England is twice the population of the entire East Coast. Really? Wow. Yep. And, and, and another hidden uh, hidden secret is California got medical cannabis back in 1996. Benjamin, do you know the second state that's the longest medical cannabis program in America? No, I don't. The state of Maine since 1999. Really? Now, a lot of people don't realize that. Didn't know. So we knew and we saw ahead where the cannabis sector was going, which is why we made sure we kept ties out here in the Mid-Atlantic region and also in the New England region as well, too. And my uh, my son went to Bates and I spent okay. plenty, plenty of time up there in Portland. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool place. Okay. Yes, I, I am quite familiar with Bates and I uh, actually played them uh, uh, against in, in basketball. Uh, went back in the day when I played college hoops. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Uh, Uncle Rico days, right? Back yeah, tell day. me about it. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, well, what was it like to go from kind of your, your doctor days and, and kind of your that training into, into medical? Because a, a lot of questions have come up on this show, uh, specifically the one with Michael Patterson about, you know, how do I transition into that? Is it hard to do? And you did transition well, even though there's crossover. So talk to me about that so that we can give some education as to those out there who are also thinking about transitioning into cannabis. Great question. And this is why I tell other medical professionals right now is back when I got involved in cannabis in 2009, 2010, it wasn't cool to be in cannabis. And I like you wouldn't even want to talk about it. More exactly. Kind of like what do you do? Uh, you know, yeah, something and, and, else, right? Exactly. In New Jersey, New York, people knew me as Dr. David, running a very successful physical therapy practice, had the contract to, uh, with some major sports teams. But outside that area, people knew me as Dr. David, who wore the big canvas pot leaf jacket at all the conferences. <laughs> so, so I was really wearing two hats. It yeah. was, and it was actually some mentors of mine in the canvas sector from the state of Maine in about 2013 or so, 2014, I said, hey, let other people know you're in the cannabis sector. Hmm. We need to have more medical professionals. So now if you're a medical professional, it's 2021, it's okay. And one of the biggest things I tell people is reread your medical code of ethics. 
Because when you read your medical code of ethics, one part says it is our job as medical professionals to educate and to empower patients with every treatment option out there. Hmm. So even if you're not pro-cannabis, even though you may not be for as maybe uh, as an alternative to opiates or whatever, you still have a medical duty to empower patients with information and knowledge on what their options are. Hmm. And then the second part about your medical code of ethics, it says if there's a better treatment option out there for your patients, and even though it might not be legal, you need to fight on your patient's behalf. So I, we actually tell people right now, and even patients who still call us every so often asking for just general information on how can I get a medical marijuana card or how can I go see a physician talk about it, that if your physician's anti-cannabis and does not want to talk to you about using medical cannabis, then it might be time to go see another physician. It's 2021. Right. It's here to stay. Over 30 states have medical cannabis programs. If your physician's not looking at the benefits of cannabis or as a form of a treatment option, then you know, at the end of the day, you know, they're, they're not doing their job for you. And I know that sounds a little harsh. Well, what would, their, what would their objections be in 2021? Like, why, why would they still not want to say, you should look at that? Not enough research, liability. Uh, sometimes people saw the prefixed ideas hmm. about, oh, you're a pothead or, you know, it, there's so many potential side effects of using cannabis, just the fear of the unknown. Hmm. So it's one of those things where you don't have to label yourself as, as a marijuana or a cannabis physician, but you also need to be educated on what, uh, what cannabis can do for you what uh, CBD, can, CBD can do for you. Um, you also sit here and kind of like if a, if a big farmer came in and told a physician, hey, try this new osteoarthritis drug, prescribe it to all your physicians, they'll take a few courses on it, and then they'll start prescribing it right away. Right. Well, you need to educate yourself of campus as well too. Mm -hmm. um, so we really tell physicians, you don't need to rip off the Band-Aid, but you can slowly ease into it. You can solely talk about it. You can say, hey, I don't, and you can admit to your patients, I don't know much about it, but here's a resource of someplace you can go to, at, to talk to someone else that is educated about it. Well, I would say that would be a way to limit their liability is to just say, I don't know, but you can go here, look for yourself, maybe at NCIA or, you know, somewhere where it's credible information and say, you can make your decision, but it's my responsibility just to let you know there are more options than this opioid that I've you know, have a contract from the, from the manufacturer to give you samples of, right? You know, it's exactly. like something, exactly. something like that. So very, like, very well said. And, and it's also too, depending what state you're in. Hmm. That's something I tell people is that, okay, like, um, and I'll use the state of Maine. We've had medical cannabis since 1999. If your physician is not talking about it right now, they've had it for over 20 years. Why not? Hmm. Whereas other states that might've just gone to program in the last two or three years, and they might still be getting comfortable with it. Do you think there's there's some sort of, I guess, uh, thinking that a doctor might say, well, my customers would then know me as a pot doctor and they're not gonna come to me anymore if they've been with me for 10 or 15 years? So I've been asked that question before and it's all about the delivery of how you bring it up. Hmm. And, it, and as I tell any physician or any medical professional, if you can talk about Advil, Tylenol, you can talk about the new anti-inflammatory medications out there. Heck, you can talk about brand new vaccines that just recently came out. Then why can't you talk about that? Yeah. It's just, you know, add it to your repertoire of right. what you offer. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I imagine there are going to be, you know, people in the older generations, doctors that are just conservative and, you know, they're not educated and they may just pass on it. They may. But as we were talking the other day on here, um, younger generation, whether that's of a legislator or medical profession or anybody in business, as you know, new gen younger generations rise up in the ranks of decision making, that's going to change. Exactly. You know, I'm sure I medical will be the same. I so. fully agree with you on that. Well, let's talk about uh, the advisory services, really. And you know, when you're raising money, which I've done too. Um, there are some common mistakes that you've talked about before that I've seen you 
talk about, can you talk about the goals? Maybe, you know, maybe the top three um, biggest or most common mistakes that you could advise people on here. Sure. I definitely can, Benjamin. And, and something we tell all of our clients here at UCS Advisors is we give them like green nuggets of information. And the number one green nugget is failure to plan is planning to fail. Hmm. Once again, failure to plan is planning to fail. And one of the biggest mistakes we <clears throat> we see people make is not have a proper exit strategy for themselves, but also for their investors. Hmm. And if you're going to take investors' money, they want to know how they're getting paid back. And you can't just say, I'm going to get acquired. Because hmm. statistically speaking, less than 13% of companies in any industry get acquired. Hmm. So what truly is the exit strategy? And we, we tell people, you got to work backwards at times. You know, what's your, what's your three-year plan? What's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? The, the, the second biggest mistake we, we tell people is really make sure you have your potential investment documents done ahead of time. Because if you go to an investor and you talk to them about, about your idea, they're like, great, I'm in. Send me the paperwork. Then you say, oh, well, uh, I need to contact my lawyer and, hmm. and have them draw up the paperwork. You just lost that potential investor. So that would be what, like a term term sheet, you know, just all the documentation that you both need to sign ready to go. Exactly. You know, that comes down to the term sheet, that comes down to the offering. Um, and people say, well, you know, I might have three different offers. Then great, have three different offers drawn up. Mm. Or, and here's a great example, let's say you're raising a million dollars. You say, this is offer A, but if you invest more than $100,000, then we have offer B or C for you. Mm -hmm. But you're thinking ahead and you're laying it out. You know, one of the other biggest mistakes uh, we, we tell people is that also free only gets you so far. And what I mean by that is the following is that people are always looking for free advice, whether it's from the lawyer, the accountant, even an investor relations advisor. But eventually you need to pay for those services. Mm-hmm. And uh, an old little factoid is however much money you're going to raise, be prepared to spend up to 10% of that money to raise that money. So if you need a million dollars, be prepared to spend up to $100,000 out of pocket to get all your affairs in order. You know, if you so need you're saying million, you should have a raise to raise money to raise, Because right? it seems like a multi-step, you know? Well, what if you are a startup and you don't have money? other than sweat equity, then how would you go about that recommend? So great question. And, and really we tell people the following is that once again, that's how you can work backwards. How much money do you need? In what time frame? In what tranches? It's amazing when people come to us say, oh, I need $3 million. And I go, great. How much do you need in the next 90 days? 3 million. Great. What do you need in a hundred, you know, 160 days or 150 days? Oh, I don't know. Well, hmm. you don't need 3 million up front. You right. might need less than that. And the other thing is, too, is for the start for any business, you know, we tell people you can always save money. You can always get lines of credit. You can always do a, a, a non-canvas business first, start mm. to develop that business credit and go from there. There's a lot of there's a lot of money out there. Mm. There's a lot of unsecured money out there as well, too. Just people don't realize what it takes to actually get that money. And that also leads to another common mistake we have is that sometimes we find money for people and it might cost eight or nine percent interest. And yeah. they'll say, Oh, I don't want to pay that much. And I go, Well, what if it's eight or nine percent and it's locked in over five years and you can prepay? Oh, I don't want to do that. Yeah, but if your performer is accurate and you believe in what you're doing, you'll be able to prepay your loan at least 12 to 18 months in advance. So the few extra interest, point, interest, point, interest points are not going to make a difference. Right. And it's yeah. really thinking about that bigger picture overall. But this goes back to, once again, what's your exit strategy where are you trying to expand? Are you trying to get acquired? Or are you just trying to grow this business for the next 20 years, leave it to your, your kids or to your grandkids? You mm -hmm. need to think that far ahead. And, and as we told people, and here's a great example, Benjamin. I like pizza. Do you like pizza at all, Benjamin? <laughs> a, a lot more yeah, so than that I It doesn't admit, mean yeah. you want to open up a pizza parlor now, does yeah. it? And that's yeah. one of the biggest mistakes we see in cannabis. 
is, oh, I love cannabis or I love CBD. I'm going to build a business. Great. Do you have any experience doing that? What's mm. your goal in it? And, you know, and it's okay because interesting enough, one out of every three people that we talk to here at UCS Advisors that's thinking about opening up a cannabis business actually becomes an investor instead. Hmm. I mean, one in three, think about that because they don't yeah, realize uh, the magnitude. They don't realize the cost to enter the market. They don't realize all the political red tape there is at times. And they realize, wait, if I'm really in this is to make money, which there's nothing wrong with, maybe I should be an investor instead of really a business owner in it. It completely makes sense. And, and, you know, that way you might be looking at the numbers more so than just kind of the passion of it. You may say, I want to start a cannabis business because because it is cool or because I want to do it, as opposed to saying, you know, this is a hot sector. It's growing this much. You know, I've done pro formas before. I've been successful with these other partners. Now I'm going to try to do it here. And you may end up saying, yeah, let's just invest in this because we know that this formula uh, or the ratio works between, you know, marketing spend, whatever that is, and equipment, maybe you can outsource whatever it is, and you might have a better head coming into it, being an investor then to just say, I want to start this business, raise a million dollars, sell it for a hundred million. Well, what's your exit plan? Well, I, well, I don't know. We might keep it if it's going well, you know, like you hear that all the time and it's not well thought out. And typically those are the businesses that, that, well, they probably don't even make it off the ground actually. And Benjamin, let's take a step further. As someone who's a, a former CEO of a publicly traded company and did his own S1 and took his company public, this is 2021. There's enough publicly traded campus companies where you can do your research, your recon work. You can look at their financials. You can look at their quarterly filings, their yearly filings, where back in 2010, 2012, there wasn't that much data. Now there is. So there's no reason at all why you should not ha why you, you should have done your due diligence ahead of time and not know the numbers ahead of time as well too so when you were saying you know what's your exit strategy some people may say well i've never done it before so i don't know but what you're saying is there's a lot of information out there that you can i mean you basically could find a pro forma and use that as a template to at least get you started to know if you understand what it's going to take to get this business going. Not that I recommend that, but there are resources out there for people to do their own, I guess, due diligence to see if it's even something they want to do. And Benjamin, let's take a step further. Let's say you're going to invest a million dollars into something. Well, why not take a step back and maybe invest a hundred grand into another cannabis company? Hmm. Because once you become an investor, they, li they lift up the hood of, uh, of the engine or the car, and now you can look at the engine, see how things actually work. You can ask questions. You can learn. Uh, we've had a couple investors of ours actually mm. invest in other cannabis deals. And now in 2021, they're eventually now opening up their own cannabis business as a subsidiary company or a satellite office or facility of the investment they originally made into. Mm. So now they actually have that support and that mm. infrastructure built in. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh I'm sure those are those are questions that you talk to people about all the time or comments that there are many options to get into this business. You're exactly. an advisor, right? Makes sense. Makes sense. So any other any other mistakes that you see or or at least well, let's see. With the changing laws, uh changing administration, do you see any more pitfalls or mistakes in fundraising or will it pretty much be the same? Uh, with the two different administrations? So when it comes to administrations, not everyone really agrees with them at this point, but let's call a spade a spade. What industry in the last 15 years, and I'm being conservative, has gone up at least 100% every year for the last 15 years in a row? It's cannabis. Hmm. So it doesn't make a difference who's in the administration. The, the industry is moving forward regardless. Yeah. And, and when people blame everything uh, on the administration, it's it's that's really not the, the truth of the matter. Mm. The industry is still moving forward, mm -hmm. uh, whether you like it or not. Uh, and, and the other big thing that we really feel as, as a huge pitfall is make sure you know on who you're pitching to and have everything done ahead of time before you actually pitch it to them. People say, oh, I mentioned to my friends and family, this is what I'm going to do. And I go, your friends and family know the bad side of you. <laughs> so before you even ask them to do anything, you need to have everything done ahead of time. And if we were to take another step further, 
And, and I actually just, I'm posting a video about this later this week is last week I attended three pitch deck events and you see people present and run out of time presenting makes no sense whatsoever. You knew you had five minutes or eight minutes or 10 minutes to present. You had plenty of time to practice your presentation ahead of time. And now you're doing it live in front of accredited investors or in front of venture capitalists. And you're like, oh my God, I, I have 10 seconds left. I didn't realize that. I have so much more to go through. Well, right. you didn't really plan it ahead of time, nor did you practice. You're right. You know, this is, there are so many deals out there in this industry. It's an investor's market. You mm -hmm. know, investors again pitch nonstop. And people forget people that have been in this industry for more than eight, nine, 10 years. A lot of people lost money in this industry early, earlier on because they took gambles and risk. Hmm. They're not making that same mistake anymore. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it's great stuff. Great stuff. I'm sure you're busy, you know, and <laughs> going to be increasingly so. Very much so. And, and, and what's really unique, something else that we're doing here is uh, because what's interesting is some states, it, depending if you're police or fire departments or even government, you are not allowed to uh, invest directly into a cannabis company. So we actually um, ha have um, devised uh, through our lawyers a plan where we can actually offer a 30% return on investments for investors in 15 months or less. Wow. Where the money is directly invested with us and our company, and we are 100% responsible for the ROI. Wow. Not the government, not the economy, not the stock market, not whoever is the president. We assume all the risk. But the other reason why we did that as well, too, is that a lot of deals out there right now, it's a minimum of 50 grand or 100 grand. And you may not get your return on investment for maybe three or four years. So this is a good way for people to kind of dip their toes in the water. We offer our minimum investment of $5,000 hmm. and you're getting your 30 percent return on investment in 15 months or less. We even take a step further where even for one day late, hypothetically paying you, we actually pay a penalty fee to you. So it's a nice way to get people to kind of get their toes wet, start to act, get acclimated into the industry and kind of see what's out there and not let these opportunities pass them by. Hmm. Because the other thing we're seeing too, especially in the last two years is, Benjamin, you may have presented a deal today. And by the time you pull the trigger, maybe eight to 10 weeks later, the deal's already closed up and it's done. Right. These deals move very, very fast and very quickly, especially the very unique and good ones. So let's end it there and by telling uh, the audience how they can learn more about the program you talked about. Uh, the best way is to, uh, you can actually uh, email us directly. Um, I have no problem giving my personal email address, which is david at ucsadvisor.com. That's once again, david at ucsadvisor.com, which is singular. You can always call our office, 201-252-7170, or you know, just reach out to us on LinkedIn. It's amazing. Um, in 2020, we actually picked up about, I want to say is between 18 and 22 new investors just from LinkedIn last year. Wow. Wow. So all this extra time just spending online for everybody who's paid off for you for sure, it sounds like. It has. And people really want to see what opportunities are out there. And, and we have a great track record. Uh, we really find the needles in the haystack. Uh, a few deals that people want to get involved in. A year or two ago, they said, no, these deals thrive during COVID. And mm. now they're on their series B or series C round, but we still have options to get in in the friends and family round, which really kind of puts us in a unique position. Right. Well, that's great. Good. Well, that's super good information. I appreciate you being on the show. Um, good luck this next coming year. What's What are you most excited about over the next 12 months? Uh, what I'm most excited about is one, the conferences coming up again. Uh, we on uh, me and my team, uh, we average attend about 24 conferences a year huh. for cannabis. So we're really excited about them. We do a lot of public speaking where we teach basic investor relations 101. And the third thing we're really excited about is is our 30 percent return on investment program. Yeah. We we did it last year. Uh, we actually, instead of taking 15 months, we hit everything in less than 10 months. Wow. So we're really excited to, to increase our database and really educate and empower people this opportunity where, you know what, you can still get involved and still make some good money in this industry. Mm. So I've got a, there's a comment here. We've got a couple more minutes and we'll yep. address it here uh, from Malona Thompson. On what should I focus my attention? Where's the lack of quality business? CBD, THC market, building material, fabric. 
where do you see a gap from your, your perspective in the investment process? Ancillary services, the non-plant touching, great question as well too, from testing labs to uh, website designers, to human resources, uh, staffing companies. This is a whole new sector. So as I tell people, look at the insurance industry, look at the banking or look at you know the technology. You need every aspect of this industry covered. Hmm. So there's a lot more opportunities out there for non-plant touching. Go ahead, find that niche. A great example is we just helped a law firm where all they're doing is just trademarks. Hmm. And they literally position their law firm just for trademarks in the cannabis industry and wow. CBD industry. Yeah, they do all their stuff, but they purposely just took that vertical so they can work with other law firms. So, so it's really the, the uh, Levi Strauss model, provide the picks for the gold, right? Exactly. Great. Well, thanks again for your time uh, and we will talk to you soon. Good luck Definitely. this year and I hope to see you live at a speaking event. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Thank you for having me today. Truly appreciate it.